SpaceX just broke an important record, NASA's interested in nuclear propulsion, and Rocket Lab has another neutron update. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 28th of July, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week, NASA has awarded contracts to 11 companies for new space development technologies. The contracts are part of NASA's sixth Tipping Point project. These Tipping Point projects are set in order to further technological development related to space exploration. Under these, the funding is shared between the companies and NASA, with the agency contributing between 75 to 90 percent of the total money expected. For these contracts, NASA is expected to contribute a total of $150 million. These technologies range from lunar surface power systems to tools for in-space 3D printing, which will expand the capabilities for a sustained human presence on the moon through the Artemis program. Five of the technologies will help humanity explore the moon, and the other six will help create new capabilities in other areas of space exploration and Earth observation. The companies in question are Astrobotic Technology, Big Metal Additive, Blue Origin, Freedom Photonics, Lockheed Martin, Red Wire, Proto Innovations, Psionic, United Launch Alliance, Varda Space Industries, and Xeno Power Systems. It's an extensive list. Okay, let's go over some of the familiar names here. For example, United Launch Alliance, ULA, is receiving $25 million in funding. According to NASA, this is to continue development of the hypersonic inflatable decelerator that will be used to bring back Vulcan's two BE-4 engines after each flight. Once their job is done, the engine section would detach from the Vulcan first stage and deploy this inflatable heat shield so it survives through re-entry and can be used again. While this is part of ULA's smart reuse concept, it could also be used to return heavy objects from orbit as well. One of the other familiar names, Blue Origin, will receive $34.7 million for what they call in-situ resource utilization-based power plants on the moon. In layman's terms, this refers to the use of local resources on the moon, like lunar regolith, to produce solar cells and wires. So these would be used to power missions on the moon with materials extracted directly from the soil instead of needing to bring it all from Earth. It's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Another one you've probably heard around is Astrobotic, which was awarded $34.6 million for the demonstration of tethered scalable lunar power transmission. Or in other words, the transmission of power through high voltage power lines on the moon, just like here on Earth. The company aims to unreal more than a kilometer of high voltage power lines from its Cube rover that could be used to transfer power from a production system to a work area on the moon. It kind of makes me want them to join with Blue Origin so that the solar panel power can also then be transmitted through those power lines and, you know, it would all fit together, right? Another lesser known company on this list is Freedom Photonics, which will develop a novel laser source that could enable more efficient light imaging detection and ranging, aka LIDAR systems. LIDAR is a measurement system that enables accurate and precise measurements of distance. But if used cleverly, one can obtain other kinds of data. In this case, NASA hopes that this technology could better detect methane in Earth's atmosphere, improving scientists' understanding of climate change. Certainly there's a lot of interesting folks doing stuff out there, and these contracts will definitely help the future of space exploration. Nuclear engines are back. DARPA and NASA have jointly awarded Lockheed Martin a contract to design and build a nuclear thermal propulsion engine. The program for this contract has a conveniently crafted name, Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cis Lunar Operations, aka Draco. It aims to create a modern nuclear thermal engine that could be quickly developed and launched into space. This would then be the proving ground for future nuclear thermal engines to power human missions to the moon or Mars, or power probes even deeper into space. Under this $499 million contract, Lockheed Martin will design, build, and test a nuclear thermal engine alongside BWX Technologies, who will build the nuclear fission reactor to power the engine. The engine would utilize the energy released from fission of uranium to heat hydrogen to 2,700 Kelvin, where it would then be ejected out the back with a specific impulse or exhaust velocity of two to five times that of a conventional in-space chemical propulsion system. The parameter of the engine is like the miles per gallon of a car. The higher the specific impulse, the more efficient the engine is. 
Now, the development of this engine will culminate with a flight test of the engine in a high Earth orbit in 2027. The test engine will be placed in an orbit with an orbital altitude of between 700 and 2,000 kilometers, and this will ensure that most of the nuclear fuel is used up by the time it re-enters Earth's atmosphere, which would take around 300 years from this altitude. To further increase safety, a piece of metal will be installed in the engine during launch to absorb neutrons, preventing the chain reaction needed for nuclear fission to start. And once in a stable orbit, this piece of metal will be removed, allowing for operation and testing to begin. Now, the whole operation is planned to run at the highest amount of safety possible, so much so there won't even be any full-up tests of the engine on the ground. The first time it'll be fully tested will be in space, so that if there were to be an accident, it wouldn't affect anyone here on Earth. In essence, this spacecraft will be a flying test stand for the engine with its own fission reactor and a tank holding about 2,000 kilograms of liquid hydrogen. Now, due to the challenges of keeping hydrogen cold in space, the time this engine can work up there will be short, only about a few months, mostly since the hydrogen will eventually boil off and also be consumed in the engine. However, there is a possibility that a refueling port might be added so that it could be refueled in space and used again. The launch vehicle for this mission has still not been selected, but it'll be provided by the Space Force through its National Security Space Launch contract. This means that it will launch on either SpaceX's Falcon family or ULA's Vulcan rockets. Draco will build upon the experience of the NERVA program from the 1960s, which initiated the work of nuclear propulsion in space, and that sadly was never actually flown. But hopefully this time around, we'll get to see it through the finish line. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. First off this week, we had the launch of this Series 1 rocket on July 22nd at 5.07 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket carried two satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit. The two payloads on board were the Chan Kun-1 Very Low Earth Orbit Technology Demonstrator Satellite for Sea Space and the Xingshai Dai 16 Earth Observation Satellite for Ada Space. A Changzhong 2D lifted off on July 23rd at 2.50 UTC from Launch Complex 9 at the Taiyarn Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying four payloads to a sun-synchronous orbit. Three of the satellites were Earth observation satellites from SkySight, which are capable of observing in optical and infrared light, as well as using radar. This launch also carried the Ling Shi 3 satellite for Galaxy Space. With this satellite, the company is aiming to demonstrate that it can manufacture a flat panel communication satellite similar to Starlink satellites. And speaking of Starlink satellites, a Falcon 9 rocket lifted off on July 24th at 50 past midnight UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It carried 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit in support of Starlink's second generation constellation. The booster for this mission, B-1076, was flying for a sixth time and successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions. Going back again to China, a Changzhong 2D rocket lifted off on July 26 at 2002 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The rocket carried three Yao Gan 36 military reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit. This is the fifth group of Yao Gan 36 satellites launched so far. And another Falcon 9 lifted off on July 28th at 4.01 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying another 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B-1062, was flying for a 15th time, becoming the third booster to achieve this number of flights. It successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship A Short Fall of Gravitas. This launch broke the pad turnaround record, setting it at just four days. Now this is important for SpaceX to practice, considering that Starship pads could be supporting multiple flights per day. So perhaps a decade from now, four days will seem slow. With this mission, SpaceX has now launched a total of 4,881 Starlink satellites, of which 3,768 are already in operational orbit. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Amazon's Kuiper satellite project has a new home at the Space Coast in Florida. The company announced this week that construction is already underway on a facility to process its Kuiper satellites before launch. As you can see, we've covered this facility in our own Cape Flyovers, but we didn't know who this new building belonged to until now. The processing facility will be located next to the launch and landing facility north of NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building. According to Amazon, the building should be operational by early 2025, so you can bet we'll keep our eye on it until then. 
This week, Impulse Space has announced that it has secured $45 million in a Series A funding round. Led by RTX Ventures, this round of funding will allow Impulse to finish development of its Mira kickstage and further develop the larger Helios kickstage. Helios is planned to be capable of transporting satellites from a geostationary transfer orbit directly into geostationary orbit. The company's first orbital mission, LEO Express 1, will demonstrate the Mira kickstage, with it performing several different maneuvers in orbit. LEO Express 1 will fly as part of SpaceX's Transporter 9 mission later this year. This week, ESA and Ariane Group announced that they had conducted a successful tanking test of Ariane 6 at its launch pad in French Guiana. The countdown test took place on July 18th and included the removal of the mobile gantry, chill down of ground and launch systems, and the load of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen on Ariane 6's two stages. The whole sequence lasted 26 hours, where teams rehearsed potential anomalies and non-nominal situations. The test was supposed to conclude with the ignition of the Vulcan 2.1 main engine, but that was something that didn't happen as the teams ran out of time. ESA says that they'll try for another test later this summer that'll include a long-duration hot-fire test of that engine on the pad. This week, Tori Bruno, ULA CEO, has shared a bit more on the company's progress toward Vulcan's first flight. This came in the form of a tweet saying, Centaur 5 is marching through the factory. The reinforced forward dome is built and getting ready to go on top of the rest of the tank. This included a picture of the tank dome while in production, so it looks like ULA is building a whole new Centaur 5 stage for the first launch of Vulcan. It's hard to guess whether they'll be able to meet a first launch of the rocket this year, so we'll just have to wait and see. Another upcoming rocket is receiving a bit of a makeover. Rocket Lab has updated its website with new renders of its reusable Neutron rocket showing some of its latest design changes. Some things on these renders we already knew, like the move from four to two pedals for the rocket's fairing. But there's other things, like the deployable landing legs or the higher fins that haven't been spoken about before. It's a little bit reminiscent of Falcon 9's first stage. I kind of dig the new look. What do you think? Does it look cool? And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. ISRO has retargeted the launch of its PSLV rocket with the DSSAR satellite to July 30th at 1 o'clock UTC. Electron's 40th launch is set for next week from New Zealand with the We Love the Nightlife mission. The two-hour launch window opens on July 30th at 5 o'clock UTC. SpaceX is aiming to once again break its pad turnaround record with a Falcon 9 launch carrying another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites. The 4-hour, 34-minute long window opens on July 30th at 2352 UTC. Next week, Northrop Grumman is set to launch its next Cygnus cargo resupply spacecraft to the International Space Station. The launch is set to occur on August 2nd at 31 past midnight UTC from launch pad 0A at the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. This will be the last launch of the Antares 230-plus rocket. Capture of Cygnus by the station's robotic arm is set for August 4th at 9.55 UTC. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.